finalizing our OpenVPN home server, as well as setting up auto start servers in Zen server, and your thoughts on China and OpenVPN. It's gonna be great. Check it out, it's Hack5. This episode of Hack5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello, welcome to Hack5. My name is Darren Kitchen, and it is your weekly dose of technolust. That's Kirby. She is co-hosting with me today because Shannon is out on vacation. Um, or maybe she's not. Maybe it's Cat5 now. I'm not really sure. That was bad. Ten years. It's really, really bad. Okay, so what we're going to do here today is we're going to follow up on our quick and dirty open VPN guide that we started last week and do the final setup to get your machine online and accessible from outside your LAN. And essentially what we're going to have to do is three basic steps. First, we need to set a static IP address on the server. Second, since we're doing this in a virtual machine, and if you've been following along with our series on that, we're using Zen, we need to set up this virtual machine to start up automatically whenever the hypervisor, or in this case, it's an Intel Nook, boots up. And then finally, third, we need to do some port forwarding. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. The static IP address setup is pretty simple. Let's go ahead and SSH into uh, hack5 at, what was it, 1073.31.240, I believe was that box. And this is an Ubuntu 14.04 TLS or LTS, good stuff. And basically, if we do an if config, we can see here, we have an IP address on our LAN of, yeah, there. But um, we, this is only dynamic. So I can find that out by saying uh, sudo nano, there's a file in slash Etsy uh, under network called interfaces. And I can see here that it is iFace F0 iNet DHCP. So all we really have to do is go ahead and change that to iNet static and then specify the address, the gateway, and the netmask. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and change that static and say address 107331. I'm going to leave it as what it is right now, 240, because I know nothing else is on it. Netmask, in this case, we're on a slash 24, so it's 255.255.255.0. And gateway 1073311 is our gateway here. I'm going to go ahead and save that file, exit out of there, and Bob's your uncle. So the next thing is, since this is a virtual machine, we do want it to boot every time this Nook comes online. And we're going to set up this Nook so that, you know, on the event of a power failure, if it reboots, the hypervisor starts up. And then the hypervisor will go ahead and start up, in this case, that Ubuntu server that we were just SSH'd into. And we will probably also want to do that as well for Zen Orchestra so that we can also do the web management stuff. But thankfully right now, there's nothing that requires going into that web management because our servers are running. So in that case, let's go ahead and SSH over to our, uh, our in this case, let me open a new terminal and make that much bigger for you to see, our uh, Zen server, which is root at one, let's see, 10.73. 31152 in my case. That looks good. And there we go. We are now on the Zen box. And we can actually go ahead, if we want, we can actually type um, XS console and get the same console that we would have otherwise got if we had the physical access to that box. So this is a really nice feature of Zen server because, I mean, it's, it's Linux, right? So what we need to do in order to set this virtual machine up so that it will boot on startup is we need to first determine the UUID of our server or our pool. In this case, we only have one server in the pool, so there you go. And then we need to go ahead and enable auto starting uh, capabilities, which is turned off by default in 6.5 uh, version of Zen Center but it's pretty easy to re-enable. So let's determine the UUID of our pool or our server with the XE pool dash list command. And we can see it right here. I'm gonna go ahead and get that guy in my clipboard. And then the next thing to do is actually just to go ahead and say, uh, let it know it can auto start, which is XE pool. We're setting a pool parameter, param. And then we set our UUID of the pool we're talking about. In this case, there we go. Um, actually, there needs to be an equal sign right here, so it knows what it's equal to. And then we also have to say other dash config colon auto underscore uh, power on equals true. Oh, I messed that up by needs to be pull param set 
and then UUID equals. There we go. So now we just do something very similar except for our virtual machine this time instead of the actual server or the pool, and that is to begin with an XE VM dash list. And we can see here are all of the different servers running on this machine. And the one that I'm interested in is this one here called OpenVPN. So I'll go ahead and grab into my clipboard its UUID and go ahead and do a very similar command. In this case, it's XE VM dash param dash set and then UUID equals and then go ahead and give it that UUID and then again other dash config colon auto underscore power on equals true. So there we go. We've gone ahead and set a static IP address for our Ubuntu server. So it'll always have that next time it reboots and next time the virtual server uh, reboots. So will that virtual machine. So there we go. The last part now is to actually go ahead and open up the ports that we need on our firewall so that everybody is all happy and we can get access to our LAN through this VPN over the internet. Now to do that, let's go ahead and take a look at our OpenVPN. And just like last time, go ahead and log in there. And you'll notice there's a few ports that we need to go ahead and open up. First of all is 943, obviously, because I'm connected to it over port 943. It's not like a regular web server that would be listening on port 80. If I go there, well, actually, it is listening on 80. Fancy that. Well, we could do 80 as well, but or 943, and you just don't do the slash admin, and you get the same thing. So. Go ahead and make note of that. And then the other ports for our VPN connections are TCP443, our standard SSL port, and UDP1194. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just leave it at that because essentially this configuration is going to go ahead and change depending on what router you use. And I'm pretty sure you're not using the crazy esoteric link bonding one that we're not using here. So it really doesn't behoove me to walk you through the steps on our end here. But uh, you know, whatever router you're using at home, uh, let us know your favorites. I saw a lot of awesome comments about PFSense uh, and all sorts of good stuff as far as like open source routers are concerned. So uh, let me know in the comments. In fact, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I've got some responses to some of the epic comments. But first, a word from our sponsor. Domain.com and .club came to Hack5 with a great idea. Build a club all about learning stuff, making things, and having fun. And so we did just that, and man, what a brilliant idea. We recently hosted our very first ever open house at the Hack5 warehouse, and with the help of Domain.com and .club, we put on a mini land party, micro drone obstacle course, 3D print fest, quadcopter race, and killer barbecue. And I must say, these guys get it. The internet, and hacker culture in particular, it's all about fostering community. From BBSs to Fidonet to IRC, it's all about coming together and having fun. And what better domain to do it than a dot .club? It's perfect because a dot .club is universally and globally understood, not just here in the United States. So if you're building a new business or naming your startup, consider a dot .club as the ultimate social domain. Join us in the San Francisco Bay Area for workshops and projects and crazy indoor quadcopter races at our very own dot .club, hackhouse.club. Then head over to domain.com slash club to register your dot .club today. They're only $9.99 a year and there are thousands of awesome options still available. Make sure to use the coupon code HAK5 to save 15% and let the guys over at domain.com know we sent you. So when you think domain names, think domain.com. All right, I have to thank you guys for the epic comments last week. I love the discussions, and I'm going to start this off with Dakota, who asks, can I set up this kind of host on HostGator or GoDaddy or DigitalOcean, etc.? My parents won't allow me to port forward on the router. Well, makes sense. Uh, well, okay, so I'm not really sure about uh, HostGator or whatever. I have had personal experience with DigitalOcean. I've used that a lot. It works great. In fact, I love how inexpensive those VPSs can be. This is really kind of the perfect thing to just go ahead and throw in the cloud if you trust the cloud service provider. More on that a little later. The other thing is if you want to do this on the uber cheap and you don't always need it, 
uh, Amazon EC2 instances can be had for as little as, what, two cents an hour or something like that. So that might definitely be the way to go if you only need something that you can pop on here and there. Um, and thanks for the question. We have another one here from Brendan who says that I use a VPN not only to stay safe on public Wi-Fi, but also to maintain my privacy after new mandatory metadata related laws were recently introduced in his country of Australia. Dude, that sucks. If my VPN server were in my house, then the metadata would still be collected. So in his case, it's actually better for him to just go ahead and VPN to somewhere outside the country. In fact, there were a lot of people who had mentioned similar things as far as uh, bypassing GOIP restrictions that were a lot of times used to make sure that you can't watch Netflix if you're in that, you know, bad country. No Netflix for you. You know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> or do what I do and, you know, VPN into the UK so you can watch BBC iPlayer. But then again, Top Gear is not on the air anymore, so really what is there to watch? Okay, I'm sorry, I've just upset a lot of Doctor Who fans. Uh, Gilherm, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, says that the whole video I was thinking about the wireless SNES controller on the table, where can he get one? Is it Bluetooth? Yes, it is the, I think it's the SNES 30? Yeah, and it is Bluetooth. I picked mine off up off on Amazon. It was probably like 20 or 30 bucks. Um, it is Bluetooth. It works great. I love it. I'm using it for something a little non-traditional, as you might imagine. Um, but we'll leave it at that. And if you want to see more about the SNES controller, we can go into it later. But that's a totally different hack. Um, and then Jeremy says that I understand what we are doing here. Um, and he goes ahead and says that uh, he understands that there is really no way to protect our packets, right? If we want to use the web, then it, it can always be attacked. So we, it should really be titled like ways to help protect your packets and nothing is going to make them safe. Um, and I totally get that. Basically, what we're doing is we are creating a secured a encrypted tunnel between where we are right now and wherever that may be. I mean, if I'm hacking across America, I might be connected to some Wi-Fi at some coffee shop, whatever have you. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm creating an encrypted tunnel between that location and, in this case, my home. Now, that, that is the same thing assuming that I trust my home connection, right? So we were just talking about virtual private servers and like, do I trust my VPS up in digital oceans? Or do I trust a VPS up in, uh, or an Amazon EC2 instance for that matter? So at a certain point, regardless of you using a VPN to protect the link between those two nodes, you are going to go out onto the public internet, right? So assuming that all lines are tapped, you're kind of screwed. In which case, there's amazing, awesome, other technologies that is not really what this is for, but look into I2P, obviously, and I probably don't know. Also, have to tell you about Tor, but uh, the Onion Router is an amazing resource as well. And that kind of leads into Rob's question, which is, would this work in China, though? And most likely not. I've never personally been to China. Um, however, I do know that the Great Firewall there is rather restrictive, and this uses, well, let's see, TCP port 443, which is the same thing HTTPS works on. Uh, however, the traffic has its own kind of unique signature, if you will. Also, the 11, the UDP 1192, it's really obvious what UDP 1192 is. Uh, that's the nice thing about OpenVPN. You have the ability to choose of either of those. And as far as bypassing the Great Firewall of China, I think that a great project to look at would be uh, OBF proxy, and we'll talk more about that later, but essentially that would allow you to mask all of your traffic as a different kind of application and make it look like your VPN traffic isn't actually VPN traffic, but it's actually Skype traffic. Uh, so anyway, that's really awesome stuff. I would like to hear from you guys. What are your thoughts? Uh, email us feedback at hack5.org. Shannon and I, we read them all. Um, we also love all of the comments. There's always great discussion going on on the YouTubes and over on the forums, forums at hack5.org. Uh, in fact, while you're over at hack5.org, you can click follow and find all of the ways to see our social networks. And, you know, actually, now's a great time to follow us on Twitter, find out what we're doing as we go into DEF CON season. We're going to be having so much fun in Las Vegas. I know that uh, Sebastian and I are doing talks on the Wi-Fi Pineapple at the Wireless Villages at B-Sides Las Vegas and at uh, DEF CON. I know that uh, we're 
having a birthday cake at the pool party at Las Vegas B-Sides. Uh, so check out LV B-Sides, it's amazing. I love that conference. If you're in Vegas a day or two early before DEF CON, it's really worth checking out. It is the complete opposite of um, that other con that is running before DEF CON. Yes, Black Hat. I, don't, I can't afford Black Hat. Anyway, whatever. Um, that notwithstanding, we are going to be having some major announcements on Monday. So stay tuned. We're going to have a special episode, Shannon and I, on Monday. I look forward to sharing with you a project that we've been working on for so long that's going to make use of some of the technology that we've been talking about today and change the way you think about lands and shells and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, so, with that, uh, I'm Darren Kitchen, and on behalf of Shannon, who is out today, we're reminding you to trust your technolust. Thank you.